Thank you very much. No other introduction necessary. Um, so, great pleasure to be here in uh, Hakata. So, um, this, this talk is about quantum space time, and of course, it's the theme of the conference, so I don't need to say very much. Uh, but let me just say that my particular interest is quantum gravity, which uh, we, of course, don't know what it is exactly. But we do know that on the limit to it's some limit, um, you should attain classical gravity, which is particularly classical Romanian geometry. And so if you go one step back from the classical limit, you should have something which is not quantum gravity, but which is, has elements of quantum gravity effects contained in it, the first order quantum gravity effects. And the quantum space-time hypothesis is that this effect, these effects are modeled as, um, as uh, non-commutative coordinates of space-time. So uh, this is certainly visible in 3D quantum gravity, where you can solve everything explicitly. It's uh, an integral system. Um, for me personally, the ideas come from an idea called Born reciprocity. So Born was an advocate um, of a kind of symmetry between position and momentum. So here's a little table. Now gravity, of course, is curved position space. But under Fourier transform, if you Fourier transform a non-abelian group, for example, um, the, this momentum is, becomes non-commutative. You can see this because the natural momentum coordinates are the covariant derivatives and they don't commute. So if you believe in Born reciprocity, then the dual would be the second line, which you could call co-gravity, that is position becomes non-commutative and momentum becomes curved. And so for many years this was uh, an object of study. There are many models of flat quantum space-times, um, including this, this one with Rueg, which is uh, quite well studied. Um, but in fact, uh, for quantum gravity you want both. You want both position and momentum uh, to be curved. Um, so that means you want both curvature of space-time and, which is gravity, and uh, non-commutativity of space-time, which is this quantum correction, Planck scale corrections. So, um, uh, and so this is the kind of rationale behind the quantum space-time hypothesis. Though 30 years ago, we didn't have too much idea exactly what this meant, but after many years of development, we do have a pretty good idea of what is the mathematics of non-commutative Riemannian geometry. So that's what I'm going to tell you. Now, of course, there are many approaches, uh, and many people in this, in this conference will talk about Alain Kahn's approach, but uh, my approach is a little bit different. Um, and you'll find it in my LTCC lectures, and also I have a book coming out next year with Springer, um, with Edwin Beggs. And what differs from Alain Kahn's approach is, is that we don't start with the Dirac operator. We start with something I consider much more fundamental, which is the differential calculus. So in my opinion, you have a, a topological space is represented by an algebra of functions on it. Um, so for example, we might, uh, uh, but the next layer of, of that you need for physics is differential structure. And this means you, have to have, you will have some notion of calculus, of smoothness. So let's just review how we're going to model, how we're going to do that in the quantum world. So classically, C infinity three functions on a manifold would be part of the exterior algebra. This would have different degrees. Degree zero would be the functions. Degree one would be the one forms. And there'd be a differential which turns any function f into a one form. Uh, these dxi's are the basis of one forms locally. Now, of course, functions and one forms commute uh, like this. And they extend to the whole exterior algebra with a wedge product. Which is, which is graded commutative, and where D obeys this graded Leibniz rule, where omega and eta are any, are any forms of different degrees. Now, in the quantum case, the idea is the space-time coordinates will become non-commutative, so the C infinity will be replaced by some non-commutative algebra A. We'll work over a field, the field can be complex numbers. We will drop uh, the commutativity assumption, so we'll drop this line. The algebra won't commute, the one forms and functions won't commute. We'll drop this, we'll drop this. But we'll keep the Leibniz rule. And so in particular, in degree one, what it means is, is that you can multiply one forms by functions from the left and the right associatively. So here is a one form dB multiplied by C and then by A, or by A and then by C. And this, this equality means that omega one is what's called a bimodule. Then we'll have the D operation, which turns a function into a one form, and this should obey the Leibniz rule. And notice here the product from the two sides. It only makes sense if you have a bimodule. Uh, it only really makes sense. You can 
force it, but it's not very natural. Uh, omega 1 should be spanned by functions and differentials of functions. Um, in a connected manifold, the kernel of D will be just the constant function, the multiples of the constant function. And that's an optional condition. Then we will require this to extend to a whole differential graded algebra, so obeying this axiom with the with d squared is zero uh, here. That will be a quotient of some universal construction. And something which doesn't happen classically, but very common in the quantum case, is there could be an element theta, one form, whose commutator or graded commutator uh, implements d. So this, because d is a derivation, and so <coughs> it's a, the algebra is very non-commutative, then d would be inner. So this is what happens, typically. But in the classical case, it's completely impossible, because classically this would be zero. So this is a, a purely quantum phenomenon, but very common. OK, so now that's just the first layer. Let's just have a quick look. I won't have too much mathematics in this talk. I'm going to try to do some actual physics. But, um, but let's just tell you one theorem from a recent paper. So uh, one quantization of the G star, G, if G is a Lie algebra, then G star the, um, has a natural Poisson bracket, which is the Kirillov constant one. Its natural quantization is the enveloping algebra. It's a non-commutative algebra generated by the Lie algebra G. And so the differential calculi on, on it are classified. The ones which are connected uh, have the classical dimension, so the dimension of, of the Lie algebra, and which are translation invariant. They, they are in one-to-one -one correspondence with pre lie structures. That means a map, circle map, obeying this condition here. And its commutator will then be a Lie bracket, and that should recover G. So then we say G has the pre lie algebra. And in that situation, um, the commutator of a function with a derivative uh, is D of this bracket. So you can see it's, it's not zero. Um, I just should say that this is the, the, this, the axioms I've written on the previous slide uh, are very general, and you can apply them to your favorite algebra. This is just one example of an algebra. You can take literally any algebra you encounter, uh, and you can ask, what are all its differential structures? Classify all the possible omega ones. Once you have omega one, uh, you can usually generate omega all degrees by some kind of skew symmetrization. In this case, it literally is skew symmetrization. The dx's and the dy's, all these differentials, they anti-commute. Um, the, and it, just to give you an example, if you have functions, g is the vector uh, Lie algebra with a diffeomorphism group, so vector fields on a manifold. If you have a, tors a torsion-free flat connection, nabla, is exactly the same as a pre lie structure. So just the bracket is just called the, is, is this. These, this, this reduces exactly to this, and, and this, which is the torsion equation. Um, so uh, so another, uh, another example would be when this, uh, CM, uh, vec this M is just a single point. So then G is just the vector space. Uh, in fact, not, not in just N points. So B is just the vector space. Um, the bracket is zero. And uh, then this axiom just reduces to saying that it's have a, a, a commutative algebra. So a commutative associative algebra is a pre structure. And so every commutative associative algebra on a vector space induces a differential calculus. So for example, if V is, is, is just one dimensional with a basis vector x, the, all the possible one dimensional commutative algebras are just given by a single parameter lambda. They have this form. And therefore, they classify by this theorem, they will classify all the differential structures on the algebra um, uh, polynomials in X, um, which will be the enveloping algebra of this, of this Lie algebra. And, uh, and so these are the relations coming from just here. Um, and what you see is, is that X doesn't commute with dx, except when lambda is 0. So that's the case of Newton. But more generally, it's a finite difference. There's a typo here. This x is wrong. Uh, it's just x minus lambda. So the finite difference calculus just arises very naturally as the unique possibility for a translation invariant connected calculus in one variable. And one extreme limit is the one discovered by Newton and Leibniz. But there's no reason at all to work in that limit. As long as you allow functions and differentials to not commute, then finite differences are, are just the, are the generic answer. OK, so that's just one example. I won't actually be talking about this one. I'll be talking about this one today. 
Um, so this is another example. Uh, if we ask, if x is a discrete set, and we ask, we take the algebra functions on the set, so this would be just all complex functions on the set, and uh, c of x, and we ask what are all its differentials. So I said that you can apply it to your favorite algebra. This is my favorite algebra today. And it turns out that the differentials uh, on this set, on this algebra, are just the same thing as graphs, directed graphs um, whose arrows um, with, well, with vertex set x. So that means, and here omega 1 is spanned over the field. Actually, this could be any field. I, we're going to have complex numbers in a minute, but here it's any field. Spanned by, the arrow, by a basis labeled by the arrows. So the arrows themselves, if you like, label the, the basis. I've called the basis vector omega labeled by the arrow. And what is the bimodule structure? Well, if I multiply an arrow from the left, I pick up the value of our function at the source of the arrow. If I multiply an arrow from the right, I pick up the value of the function at the target of the arrow. And so that means it's not commutative, because x is not equal to y. So uh, it's only possible within, within non-commutative geometry. Uh, the differential is just the sum of all arrows with all the basis vectors, but weighted by the finite difference across the arrow. So this is extremely natural, and in fact, because it's equivalent to a graph, all of graph theory is just the differential calculus. I mean, you can translate, not all of graph theory, but you can translate graph theory into differential calculus and vice versa, because they are the same, they are in one-to-one -one correspondence. So, um, so, for example, uh, now we're going to be interested in geometry, so we have a metric. So a metric for us is going to be something of this form. It's an element of omega 1 tensor omega 1. Because a metrics in, metric has two indices uh, in physics, so it should be an element of omega 1 tensor omega 1. And um, it's sum over all the arrows with some weighting. And these weights, which are the metric arrow lengths, could actually be different. You could have that the arrow, the, the distance from x to y is different from the distance from y to x. Mathematically, this would be possible. Physically, it's not clear what that means, so I'm going to focus on the case which we call the edge symmetric case. So where there's just a single, uh, the, where the, the weight is the same for the two directions. So that means that, that we are assigning an, a length to every directed, uh, every every undirected edge, to every edge of the graph, regardless of the, of the direction, we're assigning a weight. This weight geometrically is actually the length squared. And if, if the, the signature is, is Lorentzian, then some of those length squares could be negative. So for us, this will be a real number. It could be negative. Um, now, this, the simplest example, which we will be focusing on, is the case of a, a, a finite group, x. So if x is a group, there's a very natural graph on it, which is defined by any choice of generators. So if you've got any, let's take an add stable set of generators, a conjugation stable set of generators C, then you can define, in fact, they don't have to be, but we will be interested in the add stable case. You can define um, a graph by saying the edges, of the arrows of the graph are just when you multiply by a generator. So X is a point of the group. When you multiply by a generator, from your distinguished set of generators, you will go to another point of the group, and then you would say you have an arrow between them. That defines what's called the Cayley graph. And then in that situation, just as if you are a geometer, you will know that on a Lie group, the most natural thing to do is to work with a basis of left invariant vector fields, or left invariant one forms. So you can do the same thing here. From these omegas, you can take this combination, you sum over all the omegas where the difference between the two edges is the same generator. So then for each generator, we get a single one form, EA, and these are a basis of left invariant one forms. And with them, the uh, functions have very simple commutation relations. So these relations up here <coughs> become this one, that moving a function past a, uh, a left invariant one form, EA, simply right translates the function. So right translation, RA of F at X is F of XA. It's the right translation by, by A. Uh, operator, and that's what the commutator does. So this is not commutative. DF is uh, expanded in the basis EA, gives you the left invariant vector fields. These are the DAs. They're defined by this formula, and they are <coughs> simply the finite differences. So right translation minus identity. So each of these right translation operators 
infinitesimal uh, dif dif difference in, in that direction A, you find the invariant vector field. Now a metric here becomes something like this, where the GA, GAB has coefficients now in the functions on the manifold. And that looks more like a tensor that you might expect if you're a physicist for a metric. It's just translating this into in the left invariant basis. Okay, so that's what we're going to work with. Now, what are the axioms? So I'm going to just give you a very lightning introduction to non-commutative geometry in this explicit approach. We call it the bimodule approach, but uh, it comes out of experience with quantum groups. Um, this is not part of Alan Kahn's approach, but I think it's more um, accessible to physicists. Um, so a metric, as I mentioned, is something like this classically. So for us, it's an element of omega-1 tensor omega-1. We typically have a condition of symmetry, so that would be expressed by the wedge product, which, is, which, takes a, which gives you a two form from a pair of one forms. We would like to, when you apply wedge, you get zero. That would express quantum symmetry. That's the one notion. It's, it's not the only one. We'll be talking about, we won't be using it in fact. Um, then it should be invertible in the sense of a map going the other way, which allows you to take the length of a one form. And these should be inverse to each other in the sense. So if you apply the element omega, you apply the, you look, put the metric next to it and apply the in inverse metric, you should get back omega. And it's on the other side. But this just says that this matrix is inverse to this matrix in a basis. Uh, but we should. Uh, also have this map should be a bimodule map. So if you want, you should be able to take A inside from the left and A inside from the right. And it's defined over the tensor product over A, which means you can take in A through, through the two. Okay, so you need to have these bimodule properties in order to be able to contract. So for example, you want to contract a three tensor to a one tensor. You have to want to apply the round bracket, let's say, in the middle position here. Then you have to make, for this to make sense, because A could be multiplied here or here, for this to make sense, you have to have this right bimodule property. Otherwise, this will not make sense. When you have uh, this strong bimodule property, what we call strong tensoriality, then uh, actually, this, so this is just the statement of it being inverse. This is part half of the statement that the round bracket is inverse to, to G, if I write G like this. Uh, it has an immediate consequence. And that is that if you just do this little calculation, we just take this equation, multiply it by A. Now we regard omega A as a single, as a single one form. And so then we use that equation again to write it like this. Now we take A through to look like this because it's defined over the tensor product over A. And now we compare these. You can see that that means that A has, G has to be commute with A. So even though we're doing non-commutative geometry, if you have a strong, if you have this strong requirement of uh, then you, of, of a, an inverse which is tens tensorial in a strong sense, then you will end up with the metric being in the center, uh, which which has consequences. So what that means is is it's not the today's topic, but it means that um, in the real world, if if the real metric that we are looking at is the limit of a quantum one, then it won't be possible to be any metric. There will be constraints, quantization constraints, um, in order to be central. But anyway, that's not an issue for us at the moment. But that dictates the particular. Uh, but that that dictates the form of the metric. So that that is why the metric had to be of this type, with x y here and y x here, in order to be central. So uh, that's why this is the most general metric that's possible. Okay. Now, uh, next thing we need for physics is we need connections and curvature. So a connection classically would be something like this, where you have Christoffel symbols. I've written in a slightly unusual way. Normally, you would have a, the, the curvature derivative of a vector field. But if you just take the vector field x and you, you evaluate it against this one form, then you will have the usual curvature derivative. So uh, we, just, we don't want to fix a particular vector field. So we take all the curvature derivatives along all possible vector fields, and we write them together by thinking of Nabla as a map from omega 1 to omega 1 tensor omega 1. So this just encodes the, the, the connection. Now, of course, the connection should obey the Leibniz rule. So if you take a function, it should come out with a D, or it should uh, or, um, or it should just come out directly. So that's the usual connection, which is known since the 70s. Uh, what's more recent, it was particularly pioneered by Michaud, uh, Michaud, um, Peter Mikon and Duval Violet and, and some others, um, is this notion of um, a bimodule connection. So that allows you to have 
uh, a right-handed Leibniz rule, because you can multiply omega 1 from the left and the right. It would be totally illogical to just have this one and not have some rule for the other side. So the rule from the other side is similar. If you multiply a function by omega by f, you should be able to take f out. That's fine. And then you should have another term, which is omega tensor dF. But there is one problem, because these, the left-hand output of Nabla is waiting to evaluate against the vector field. That, so that's fine here. But here, the vector field has to couple to dF. So dF has to be on the left. So you need some kind of map which will flip you from, which will flip these two. And in the classical limit, this would be the flip map. So you need to, uh, now this is not additional data, because this is this defines sigma. So if a connection admits such a sigma, that will be nice. We call it a bimodule connection. And if it doesn't, then it doesn't. Uh, but it's not additional data. Um, so we're going to work with bimodule connections. Now if you have a bimodule connection, then if you have uh, an element, then it automatically ascends to tensor products. So if I have an element of the tensor product, then the connection is to apply Nabla to the first one. Fine. Apply Nabla to the second one. But now the left-hand output of Nabla is in the wrong place because it has to be to the far left. When I have a vector field, I'll evaluate it on the far left to get my actual covariant derivative. So I have to have something that flips the one, two factors, and that will be done by sigma. So this makes sense. You can check that it obeys the same axioms. It is itself a bimodule connection. So in fact, if you like category theory, then the category consisting of bimodules E together with, con with, connect together with bimodule connections this forms a monoidal category. You can tensor product objects. Um, so, um, okay, I actually tried not to do maths today, so I will not say any more about that. Uh, just to show that it's natural. Now, now it makes sense because G is an element of omega 1 tensor omega 1. That's where the metric lives. So now this makes sense. So now we can say we know what is metric compatibility. The other ingredient we have for geometry is torsion. And torsion uh, turns out to be just the difference. There are two ways to go from omega 1 to omega 2. One is to apply D. And the other way is to apply Nabla, which goes to omega 1 tends to omega 1. And then apply the wedge product to D, to omega 2. So that's here. So for these two ways, the difference of these two ways is the torsion. So you don't find this in a geometry book, but this is the true meaning of torsion. Um, and that, that, uh, that, this di that this diagram commutes. So the two ways to go are the same, that this equals zero. So now we know what this means. So, uh, so that is a, a quantum, we call that a QLC, or quantum leverage beta connection. You have a curvature. This is a, a what, two form valued operator on one forms. You have a Laplacian. So this is to apply D, that's a one form, apply Nabla. That's in omega one tensor omega one. Now apply the inverse metric you have another function. So this goes from A to A. So this would be the Laplace Beltrami operator. So all of the ingredients of physics are there. Um, you, one more ingredient is you need to work over C, and you need a star algebra if you want to do physics. And everything should be compatible with star. So star should commute with D. The metric should be Hermitian in the sense that if you apply star to both factors and then flip, you should get back G. And the connection, the Christopher symbol should be real, and that corresponds to this equation abstractly. This is metric compatibility. Uh, this, is, this is reality for the connection. Um, and then you need one more ingredient for the Vichy tensor. You need a map to go from omega 2 to omega 1, tensor omega 1, because the curvature goes to omega 2. So if you lift, if you apply i to this, then now the curvature goes from omega 1 to omega 1 cubed. And now you can apply trace to trace out two of the omega 1s, and then you will end up with Vichy in here. So, uh, but this does require additional data. It's not part of the differential calculus alone, uh, or the connection alone. Um, that's the Ricci tensor. Um, and then um, you take the Ricci scalar. It's defined by contracting the Ricci, Ricci, Ricci tensor. Uh, I don't know how to do the Einstein tensor or stress tensor, so, uh, but, uh, which you need for physics. But in the examples that I will show you, I do know. So. What we, where the state of the art is all the mathematics is now done. It's in my book with Vegs and in my lectures and in other in works by, and also by other people. Um, but the physics is not known because we don't really know the, the Einstein tensor, etc. And so today's talk is going to focus on the physics. And I'm going to just do it by showing you two models where I do know the answer. 
Um, let's start, well, let's start with something a little bit simpler. We're just going to take x to be functions on, um, on z2, set of two points. So the graph is just a graph with two vertices and one edge. The most simple thing, just to warm up, this is just a warm up. Um, so we can think of that as a group z2, you don't have to, but it's useful to think of it as a group, of two, the group of two elements. Um, and omega 1 is a span of these two, di two directions, the arrow one way and the arrow the other way. Uh, but we can think of that as span over, e over a single basis vector, which is a single left invariant vector. So the generating set of the group is 1. There is one <coughs> left invariant vector field, which is this sum. And then the omega 1 is spanned over the algebra by the single vector. So every one form is a function times this vector. Um, the commutation relations are times this one form. Commutation relations are f with, with, e, with this e1. It sort of right translates by, by 1. So that's shifting by 1. This is the right translation operator. And uh, df is just a single derivative operator, which is just the, right, the shift minus 1. Uh, and omega squared automatically is 0. A metric has to be of this form, any function times e1 tends to e1. In the old money, in the old previous way, it's a linear combination of these vector fields, of these vectors, uh, I mean of these one forms in my vector space omega 1. And, um, and they have two coefficients, a0 and a1. So the meaning here is that a0 is the edge weight associated to the edge from 0 to 1. And a of 1 is the edge weight associated to the, uh, to the arrow from 1 to 0. And we're going to work in the case where they're equal. So in fact, where it turns out that a quantum levy to connection exists in this example, if and only if the edge weights are equal or one is minus the other. So minus the other is, we don't know what it means physically, so we're just going to focus on the case where they're equal. So a is going to be a constant then. So now a is a constant, a metric is just e1 tends to e1 times a constant. Um, there is a one-parameter solution for the quantum levy to connections, torsion-free metric compatible, they have this form. Um, so nabla of e1 is a function times e1 tends to e1, and that function is given on the two values here. And q is a, a root parameter, which is a modulus 1 parameter. And so that, uh, that comes out of the reality condition, forces this to be the case. And um, the, uh, so of course you can take, you, you could take, uh, you could take q to be 1 if you know, or minus 1. Um, the uh, Laplacian, um, to applying this formula, a little back of the envelope calculation will tell you it's equal to this. Okay, so that's, so that's the geometry. Now the action. Well, the action will be basically be the Laplacian applied to f and then f star and then integrated over the manifold. So that means summed over z2 in our case with a measure mu. And for the measure, I will take the, the, me the determinant of the metric. So that's A. Um, and so this will be this. So that comes out just to be this combination. So it's the modulus squared of, of, zero, of F0, F1, and of the difference. So that's the, that is the uh, scalar field action. Now it's useful to Fourier transform it. So there are two plane waves on Z2. One is the constant function, and the other is the function which, has, which changes sign. And so then if I expand f in those terms, then it just means that the, uh, the value of the function at 0 is this combination, and the value of f1 is this combination, and f0 and f1 here are the Fourier coefficients. So these are my momentum variables. Um, so now I'm going to do quantum field theory, but I'll do it in momentum space. So it will be the integral of all possible uh, f0, all possible f1, e to the i of the action. The action in momentum space looks like this. That's a Gaussian. So, the, so you can integrate it, you can solve it. This is what the correlation functions look like. The only thing I want you to take from this is, is that um, this is uh, that this, this would have a UV um, an IR divergence. If the mass was zero, there would be a di there would be a divergence here. Uh, but for a massive field, this is controlled. Okay. So that was a warm up. So now we're going to do the case of interest. So I'm going to do two models. One is going to be the square, and the other is going to be um, the integer line. So on the square, and these are from two recent papers of mine. So this is from this paper, came out in October. So the group is going to be z2 cross z2, which is four points. I've labeled them 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. So the group is being used to coordinatize my square. 
the, the group Z2 cross Z2 provides the coordinates for my square. Um, the a metric is of the form some function E1 tends to E1, some function E2 tends to E2. And these functions correspond to the edge weights as follows. I I've, I've, I've haven't written the brackets. So A11 means the value of A of the function A at 11. And that corresponds to the edge weight from 11 to 0, to zero from that way. And then we would like have the edge weight the other way, etc. Now we want the edge weights to be equal, so that imposes a differential equation on my on my on my metric functions, and that is this. The derivative in the one direction, the finite difference derivative, of A should be zero, the derivative in the two direction of B should be zero. So I'm going to suppose that. That simplifies the calculations quite a bit. Then we find a very similar story. There is a one parameter moduli of quantum leverage and eta connections, uh, and they have this form. Um, well, I'm going to define, they have this form. Nadler of a one form is going to be theta tensor omega minus a flip, this map sigma, of omega tensor theta. Uh, where theta is a, it's an inner calculus, theta is this combination E1 plus E2. And um, sigma is defined by this matrix on the basis, on the basis, you know, E1 tensor E2, etc. Uh, and um, the, this Q is this function, I've given it on the four points on the group, it's this function built from Q. Q is a free parameter, but it should have modulus 1. Um, alpha and beta are functions built from A and B uh, in this way. They kind of, they would be 1 if functions A and B were constant. Um, so, so this encodes the kind of fluctuations of the metric. And that de defines the quantum Navier-Schwarz connection. So that's, uh, that's for, this, this is a theorem for generic for generic metrics, for generic A and B, subject to this equation. If you have a specific metric, there might be additional possibilities if the metric has another symmetry. Um, this connection has curvature. I, you don't have to absorb this formula, just, just to give you a flavor. Um, I should have said that this calculus is two-dimensional. There is, there is the one form E1 and the and one form E2 for the two generators of this group. This group has two generators, so C is 0, 1, comma, one zero are the two elements of the generating set, and uh, because it's two-dimensional, the, the Grassmann algebra among the one forms. So that means there is a two-dimensional, there is a, a unique one form of degree two, which we call the volume form. This is E one tensor E two, and R is a map from omega one to um, to omega two tensor omega one. So it has some coefficients, which are these. These are function coefficients, and these R here are the right translation. So anyway, so it's a mess, but the, you, you can work out, now if you take the anti-symmetric lift, lifting a two-form at an anti-symmetric combination of one form, the usual way, then you obtain the Ricci tensor, and then you contract it, you obtain this Ricci scalar. So this is the Ricci scalar. Um, chi is a particular function on the group. Um, and you can see it involves the derivatives of A and B. Now, um, now we choose the measure, and I'm going to take the, the, the determinant of G, which is AB. You might think so a determinant, but that doesn't work. But the dimensions are a bit screwed up from classically, because you might think a graph would be dimension 0, or you might think a graph would be dimension 1, or in fact, you might think it's dimension 2. So dimension counting, as you know, it is not really a good guide. Uh, it just turns out that this, this, the right power of determinant is 1. So we just say determinant here. Um, in the Euclidean case, A and B would be bigger than zero, and then the the action would come out as the integral of the of the Einstein of this scalar curvature, which is the Einstein-Hilbert action. This would then be the Einstein-Hilbert action, and as you can see, um, it's something which measures how much the metric fluctuates. Um, if the metric is constant, then this will be zero. It has a minimum at zero, in fact. Um, it measures the kind of energy in the gravitational field, so that kind of makes sense. Uh, the rectangular case, so these are quadrilaterals because the lengths are arbitrary, but the rectangular case where the lengths are constant across the two edges, so A is constant and B is constant, that means that the parallel edges have the same length. Um, that's, that is the one of, that is the minimum energy configuration. The momentum <coughs> mode expansion, we're going to do the momentum mode in space, so we're going to make a momentum mode expansion. The plane waves, there are two other plane waves of interest. Uh, well, there's a constant function, there's phi, which is this, which is the plane wave in the in the one direction. There's the plane wave in the two direction, which is uh, psi, and there's the product, which is 
which is chi. I already mentioned chi. So, but we don't need chi here. Um, so now we can expand our fu metric functions. So a and b are arbitrary functions and subject to that differential equation, that, that which, has, which makes the edge lengths the same. So the, uh, that implies that a and b have this form. They're expanded in Fourier modes like this. A3 has, they have no uh, chi component. Now, uh, the uh, einstein hilbert action then becomes, the momentum space just becomes this. Um, where I've changed variables from k1, um, the, so the momentum variable is k, k0, k1, etc. But I'm going to look at the relative momentum. So k is going to be the ratio of k1 to k0. So k0 is the average length of the vertical, of the, of the A, of, sorry, the horizontal edges. And k1 is the relative, is the, is the, um, measures how much it changes uh, across between the two edges. And, and chi is the relative, a, 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 sorry, k is the relative fluctuation, relative to the average. And that, um, now I don't want the thing to change, so I have, to, so in, as I fluctuate the metric, it must, A must always remain positive um, in Euclidean case. So that means um, uh, I must bound k. Um, and that's good because this action wouldn't, would blow up otherwise. So this all makes sense. Um, there's, uh, now, the, in, we're actually going to work in the Minkowski version. So in the Minkowski version, I'm going to replace, uh, I'm going to look at minor, I'm interested, in A is going to be negative. So the horizontal edges are, time, are um, space like, and um, uh, the vertical edges time like. The, um, and so I'm going to expand minus A in my Fourier coordinates rather than A. Um, so that will change the action, and the mu will also change sign. So then the action now looks like this. It's the same as before, but there is a minus sign here. And I'm giving this combination a name. I'm calling it alpha of k. Um, so that the action looks like this, same as I had before, but with a minus sign. Now we're going to look at the partition function for quantum gravity. We're going to do the integral over all possible metrics, uh, which means I'm integrating over all k zeros, which is the average metric length, and all k's, which are the relative fluctuations. I should say one thing. This action has two parts to it. Because of the minus sign and the i, in, there's an i here. It's i over the coupling constant g times this thing. And there's a similar one with l. But the one with an l has a minus sign. So that means actually it's going to give the complex conjugate. So actually the partition function is, is z, z bar, is the modular square of z. And I only have to do half the work. I only have to solve for the k theory. The L theory is just the complex conjugate. So I'm just going to focus on the K part of the theory. Um, and so I'm doing this partition function. This is um, because of the change in, me in measure. The measure was dk1, dk0. But because of this, of the k0 here, the measure changes. So now the measure becomes, there's a k0 in the measure uh, for the change of variables from k1 to k. Uh, this, is kind of integral, this kind of integral you can do very easily. You can do the k0 integral, and then you can, do the, um, you, can, uh, you can allow for the k0 here by writing that as a differential d by d alpha, because this will bring down the k0. If you differentiate this d by d alpha over here, you will bring down a k0. So, so you can express it this way. Uh, and then we can change variables from k to alpha where k and alpha are related like this. Now alpha goes from 0 to infinity. It's just convenient. So that's our partition function. Actually, this partition function diverges in two ways. Firstly, it diverges at k0 is infinity. So I've fixed that by limiting my fluctuations to L. So I've controlled the infrared divergence by limiting my, my, my metric length to a maximum length L. Uh, uh, that's for the average length. And there's another divergence hidden in here when you work it out, which is at alpha equals zero, which is also at k equals zero. So little k equals zero, which is a kind of uh, uh, UV divergence, uh, is also there. Now we look at the ratio uh, for the expectation value. So expectation value of, let's say, k zero to the m will be the, the same thing, but with a k zero to the m inserted divided by the same thing by, by z. Now, the divergence is um, 
at um, that these are these are both divergent at at, at a equals at uh, k equals zero, but you, but that's not a problem. You can the lim the ratio is still well defined and has a limit. So you replace k equals zero around zero. You have to isolate it and put a parameter epsilon, and then work out the 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 integrals, and then take the limit of epsilon and go to zero. Everything is well defined, and you get a perfectly good answer. So the so I mean you expect this even on four points. You, you know quantum gravity is extremely divergent, right? Nobody can do quantum gravity because it's too divergent. But by making it only four points, we actually can do something. It is still divergent, but everything is under control uh, when our universe only has four points. So that's that's the answer you obtain. Uh, so now there's just one little consequence of this. So we're actually not interested in k's themselves, but in a. So when you translate back. A0,0, zero, zero, for example, back in, in, uh, is just built from k's. It looks like this. Uh, when you take, so I mean, remember, um, this a's and b's were defined by k's and l's. So, um, so A0,0, zero, zero, equation value comes out to be 2 thirds l. The equation value of the square is different. It comes out to be l squared. So that means there is a variance. So, the excision value of a squared minus the excision value of a all squared, its square root, which is the, the standard, uh, well, the, the uncertainty or standard deviation, relative to a zero zero itself, the relative st uh, fluctuation in the quantum metric is a constant. So, okay, I'm going to finish this model very quickly uh, and then show you the other model. Um, so this is uh, this is. Uh, um, a, a prediction of the theory, if you like, a, a physical effect. So, uh, and you could speculate this has something to do with a cosmological con constant, with the kind of vacuum energy fluctuation of the metric. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can qu you can keep you can not quantize the whole metric, but just keep the average metric as a background and quantize only the back background fluctuations. When you do quantum gravity, you often you do that. You you quantize fluctuations relative to a background. And so then K0 and KL are like, L0 are like coupling constants. The integral looks like this again. This time you can do the integrals again. And this integral, I just, it's not, I haven't got it in closed form, but it looks like this. And uh, it has a real part and an imaginary part. Now the imaginary part is what you expect for a scalar field. So for large, for weak G, this looks like a scalar field. And uh, the, if you would look carefully at what I had before, the instrument values, the correlation functions, they had an I in them. And that's exactly what you get. You get something, a scalar field at large, at a weak g. But at large g, in fact, the imaginary part goes to zero, and g, this part, goes to a third. So what you have is, you have a constant variance. Uh, again, this, um, uh, this thing gives you, uh, is equal, this variance, relative variance is this. And it comes out now to be one, one over root three in the deep quantum gravity limit, where g goes to infinity or k zero goes to zero. So this is another quantum gravity effect seen this way. Okay, I'm going to skip over the next slide because I'm running out of time. Um, so that was one model. Now I want to show you another model just to show you that this is not just uh, an accident. This theory just works. You can apply it to any graph. Um, the, so I'm going to apply it to the line graph. So the integers regarded as the graph. Mm -hmm. So they're labeled by integers. There is one edge between adjacent integers. The generating set of the group is, is plus or minus one. So there are two one forms, E plus and E minus. Um, these are the differentials. Um, I mean, these are the commutation relations of functions against the one forms, the way I just explained to you. Um, omega 2 is omega two is one dimensional because there is one top form. It's the Grassmann algebra on E plus E minus. So there's the first surprise. The real line is a two dimensional object. Okay? So, well, it's, a bit, it's like, with the, like with the square. It really has a natural two dimensional differential structure. So the metric is, has two coefficients. But if we wanted to be edge symmetric, now being edge symmetric imposes this condition that this coefficient is just the right trans the, the, the translate of this condition. R minus is just shifting my, one down. Um, and so that ensures that the, the edge lengths are the same. So, uh, so, so our metric is controlled by just one function on one sequence, one function <coughs> on Z. The, um, we're going to the, you can solve for the QLC, so there is a unique quantum levitivity connection for a generic A. Uh, it has this form. 
um, I'll just focus on this, where the thing depends only on the ratio. So it depends only on rho, where rho is the ratio of the metric length at an edge and the metric length at the next edge. So their ratios are how much the metric length changes between two adjacent edges um, is what enters into the, into the Christopher symbols for the connection. And it also enters into the curvature. The curvature is the derivative of this rho, and the Ricci tensor is the derivative of the rho, which is the Ricci scalar. And now you work out the Einstein-Hilbert action. So the Einstein-Hilbert action, you integrate over mu. Mu is going to be A, the, the metric itself. It's the determinant of the metric. The minus 2 is just to, meet ma to match conventions, with classic conventions. I'm going to throw away a constant, and I'm going to throw away a total divergence, because I'm going to assume my function of decay of infinity. So then, in that case, this, when you do the calculation, it comes out to be this. And this is, a just, this is just the scalar Laplacian on a graph, on, 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 the, on the line. This is the usual finite double difference operator. So this is what you would think for a scalar field. But only the weird thing is, is that this is, this is this, so, so quantum gravity is a scalar field theory on the, in this case. But what's really weird is, is that rows are positive. Of, uh, this, by the way, this theory is I'm going to regard this direction as the time direction. So this is 1 plus 0 space time. And so this is, uh, that's why A is positive, everything is time-like. But so this row is positive, is a positive number. So it's, it's scalar field theory, but with positive um, scalar field. It's a bit like tropical <coughs> geometry. OK, I just want to close. I've got, only got a few minutes left. I want to, uh, I'm going to skip the whole section on scalar field theory, because I run out of time. Uh, but there is a Laplacian. You can solve the scalar field theory explicitly um, in, uh, in different ways. All I want to do is I'm just going to focus on the wave equation for scalar fields for a reason I will tell you. So just forget all this and just go down here. Let's look at, let's look at scalar field theory in more detail. Not gra quantum gravity, but we're going to look at scalar fields on the space-time, in 1 plus 0 space-time. So this is the wave equation, where delta z is the usual double difference operator. So this has um, solutions of this form. They look like uh, usual e to the i, you know, usual plane waves. But the mass is, has to be changed from m to m0, which is the effective mass defined by this formula. Or if you like, x is m0 root a. So, uh, so, the, scalar, so the scalar fields are solved by plane waves of this form. I'm going to look at real, real value, not positive, but real value scalar fields. So this makes it real, uh, where alpha and alpha, uh, alpha is a complex coefficient. Now, um, I'm going to just look at one bit of gravity. I'm not going to do quantum gravity today. I actually haven't done it yet. It can be done, uh, but I'm going to do um, I'm going to do uh, the Hawking effect in in, in three minutes. Um, so the alter so the, to do this we have to do the quantum field theory version of the plane waves. So what happens in physics is you take the plane wave solutions and then you 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 change the coefficients to operators. So they become a and a dagger. Otherwise the same plane wave as I had before. I just replaced alpha by, by a, a and a dagger with the usual commutation relations. And then you can do things like you can work out the, you can solve the quantum field. It's just scalar field theory on a line, on a lattice line, uh, in, in 1 plus 0 dimensions. The time ordered correlation functions, they look like this. And, uh, and um, now, Hawking effect is the following. We solve wave equation, but now on the curve space. So we have the, we have the curve, we have the curve me metric, we have the metric. We have the Laplacian. This is the Laplacian. Um, so we we solve we're solving that Laplacian on the curves on the curve space. And so that is this fine double difference operator where the CIs are coefficients built from the metric. Now we suppose that for large negative i negative time, uh, the metric is constant, and we suppose for large positive time the metric is constant. And there is a region of time i equals one up to n minus one where the metric is fluctuating. There is a wave coming in, some metric fluctuations, and then wave going out. And we solve the equation through, we, we, we write, a, we look at a solution which looks like a plane wave at large negative i. So this phi in is a plane wave at large negative i, there's a certain normalization. But, um, we, uh, but we solve, when we get to i equals 0, uh, i equals 2, 3 onwards, we solve, we, we extend phi in by solving the wave equation. We get a solution. Now we do the same thing at the other end. Um, we can uh, we can we can we can we can have a plane wave phi out, which is the solution to the plane wave for large i. Here the metric has a different value b, so the, the y is a different variable y. 
for the for the metric length. Um, but uh, there's the flame weight for large i, and then we solve it backwards to extend it to negative i. So we have the phi out solutions. And we can write the flame weight either in terms of the phi in solutions or the phi out solutions, de depending on the choice of parameters. These are the alpha in and alpha out. They just so that all the solutions of the flame weight, all the solutions of the wave equation are of this form with a parameter alpha, 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 or a parameter alpha out, depending on your choice. Of course, the two are related by a Bogoli or Bob transformation. So phi out is a combination of phi in uh, um, and phi in bar, or if you like, a out a's are like this. Now, in the quantum theory, what you do is you just you have the same thing. You have the quantum field. You use the same plane waves as before, but you replace the coefficients alpha, uh, or I think I, I call them a. You replace the coefficients a in and a out by operators. So they are capital A for the plane waves coming in and I call them capital B for the plane waves coming out. So the output plane waves are quantized with AA dagger, the, 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 in, the, um, sorry, the inward ones. The outward ones are quantized with BB dagger. You have a choice. The two are related by a Bogoli or transformation. So now when you look at, if you are in the vacuum state in the input side at large negative time, you have a, a vacuum in the large negative um, uh, I, then, and you look at it from the point of view of later time then the occupation number is given by the vacuum state at large negative, at, at, at the in vacuum, but times the B dagger B is the occupation number for a later time. And then when you substitute in this and do some calculations, you get, you get that it's modulus G squared. Um, so that's a standard calculation. Uh, so now in our case, we can solve it, let's say for a step function. So here we just have a metric that goes like this. It's constant, value A, and it jumps to value B at I equals zero. So that's a step function, and let's just work out the Hawking effect for that. So um, you, you, you solve this way I told you, and you find that A out is related to A in, in this way. So then that gives you the occupation number, is a modular squared of this coefficient, this coefficient here. And so that uh, comes out to be this. So this is uh, the root rho minus root, so this is, um, it measures, it's, it's related to the Ricci curvature, because remember that the Ricci curvature is also involves the difference, well, it involves rho, uh, rho being different from one. So anyway, it involves root rho, root uh, rho inverse. Um, and in the continuum limit, there's actually, it actually has a limit as a goes to zero. So in the limit, as your lattice becomes a real line, the, 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 I'm going to stop, the Hawking effect, this Hawking effect, which is uh, actually gives you an answer, of this amount of so a single step function in the metric, which is a huge, which will generate physically will generate huge gravitational, I mean huge uh, energy because of the huge change in the metric, a very rapid change, and it will have this effect. Um, in, okay, so I'm going to stop there. I just have some conclusions, but it's just basically what I've been saying. So I'll, I'll run out of time. Okay.